when I was an undergrad and even graduate school, all we ever learned about DNA was that it was a blueprint for the human body. Essentially, the DNA was what encodes for proteins, and then the body will decide when to express these proteins so that we can build new cells or we can build proteins and enzymes for cellular function. Um, and I was a student back in the day when the Human Genome Project was being completed. And I distinctly remember being in undergraduate school at the time and being super excited because the Human Genome Project was going to change the world. We were going to all of a sudden figure out what genes encode for what proteins, and then we can do gene-specific medicine and all, all of these things that really never panned out, right? Um, because our concept of of the DNA, at least that the mainstream concept of the DNA as a blueprint, I think is very minor compared to what the DNA actually is. I, d I do distinctly also remember that when the Human Genome Project was completed, they they thought that the, that they realized that only approximately one to two percent of all of this, this DNA code actually encodes for building proteins and enzymes. So they said, OK, well, th th here's the genome. These are the genes that we need to know. These are the ones that actually function to help build uh, build these proteins. So clearly then all the rest of the DNA is is junk DNA. So we got 98% of the DNA is junk DNA or a friendlier way that they called it was non-coding. Um, and so this focus was again on the fact that, oh my gosh, there, there's these 2%, let's focus on the 2%. And let's just assume because we don't know what the rest of it means, we can't translate it, we don't have the language for it, let's just call it junk and overlook it. If we kind of fast forward, you know, this junk DNA has been analyzed and it's actually really rich in things like regulatory sequences. But what I'm especially interested in is that it's really rich in repetitive patterns that have this fractal or self-similar organization. So anytime you have repeating patterns of a self-similar -sim organization, you have a fractal and you essentially can create what's called a fractal antenna. And in spe specific, what we'd call a broadband multi-scale fractal antenna. That means that this is a fractal antenna that's able to attract a wide range or receive a wide range of frequencies of all sort, as opposed to as opposed to an antenna that's very specific for just radio waves or just um, this band of microwaves, a broadband antenna can receive all sorts of frequency information. Now, this has been overlooked, right? Uh, it's been considered woo. However, um, with the fractal antenna, you, you, you see these nest, essentially these nested repeating sequences going from uh, all the way from the DNA nucleotides themselves to the chromatin that, roll, that the DNA rolls around to the actual chromosomes themselves. They're considered these nested shapes. So again, I think the, we're overlooking the fact that, you know, yes, we, we only quote unquote know that these sequences of codons encode for genes. We only, we only recognize those because that's the only language language we speak, we're missing the entire picture of how the sequences can essentially fold and, and, and wrap around themselves to create this fractal antenna. Um, now, these fractal antenna, because they're a broad, they're, they're, they allow the reception of a broad a broadband frequency range, it means that we can also have uh, receive information. We can we can change gene expression, but we can also have things like nonlinear responses. We can receive information and then have a whole sequence of effects happening in the body. Um, likely, these fractal this fractal antenna structure of the DNA is really good for store, storing and processing all sorts of environmental information. It makes perfect sense that I've got re reception in my body for things beyond my five senses, uh, because because my five senses, sure, we, I can sense things like temperature and various smells or sounds in my environment, but the vast majority of frequency information, over ninety nine percent of the frequency information in my environment, is not sensible. I, I, it's not being able to be perceived by my senses. And so because of that, I certainly should have a means of being able to adapt and sense this frequency information from the Schumann uh, harmonics to the Earth's gentle geomagnetic pulse to light that's being emitted by me or by this plant behind me or by even by the food that, I, that I'm eating. Um, and so in other words, we, we have to be able to a way to uh, to sense this. And so by simply viewing the DNA as a genetic blueprint, like this building blocks construction manual, I think it's way better for us to view the DNA as a sensor of this wide range of frequency information that our body uses to adapt in real time. 
So lots of research has been done on this. Glenn Ryan uh, was a specific researcher who I loved his work on this. I had uh, the pleasure of meeting him at Jerry Pollock's water conference last year. And he has such, he's such an outside the box, interesting thinker. And he has done several experiments on DNA showing that G D the DNA can actually change shape, either wind tighter or unwind in response to the coherent emotional states. So for example, focusing specific intentions on the DNA to either wind or unwind or focus different coherent coherent emotional states on the DNA cause it to either wind or unwind. Specific, specific sound frequency, same thing, change this GNA shape. It, it, uh, and so did heart, this concept of heart coherence. So uh, essentially connecting where we are sh sh uh, sending our intention and our emotion through that heart center, being able to connect that energy to the DNA showed changes in the DNA being able to fold or unfold. So the DNA was ch literally changing in response to frequency information. So, so why does that matter? Well, in order for DNA to express itself, in order for a protein to actually be produced in the first place, and I'm and I'm not just talking about gene expression or protein, uh, the 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 you know production of proteins in the body. I'm really talking about that winding and unwinding can actually change biophoton emission in the DNA, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. But from the most basic standpoint, when DNA is in its wound up state it has to have an unwinding in order for a gene to be expressed in order for essentially the body to produce a protein from that genetic information. And so by simply being able to use intention or emotional states to wind or unwind the DNA, essentially it means that all sorts of frequency information, all sorts of epigenetic information beyond my five senses has the ability to affect gene expression. Um, another researcher whose work I really like is the work of Dean Radin. Uh, Dean does less work specifically on the DNA, but I like Dean Radin's work on intention uh, because what Dean Radin shows is that uh, focused intention can alter what are considered random processes. So what he really did was he showed that we can use intention or uh, group generated emotional events. So things like the, the state of emotion of the world after an emotional event, such as 9-11, was able to uh, change random number generators. So a random number, number generator is a machine that is just literally, it's designed to generate only uh, numbers in, random, in a random fashion, random, 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 random. And when that random number generator had focused it group intention or like a collective emotional experience happened in the world, all of a sudden the numbers stopped being randomly generated, meaning there was something in the field that was like this field level effect that was influencing this particular uh, machine. So this is this really this interaction between mind and matter or between consciousness or a field and a physical substance such as the DNA. So if, if consciousness can influence physical systems, as Dean Radin's work showed, then the DNA, plus I truly believe the structured water surrounding that DNA, could absolutely be a mind-matter inter uh, interface. Another researcher who I really like, the, um, the, this concept of the D DNA, the fractal antenna, biofield information, how this all intersects, is Beverly Rubick. I also got to meet her at the water conference. She was lovely to talk to. And what she showed was that uh, her research essentially suggests that cells emit and respond to electromagnetic uh, signals or like these ultra weak light emissions or, or coherent oscillations that are continually being produced in the body. And so her work is, is kind of proposing that living systems, we are these networks that are ready to receive wave information. And so we're able to, through our biofield and also through our physical body, and again, I believe through the water network and through the DNA, we receive this wave information and we allow, it allows our body to receive it, to transduce that wave information and to transmit it. So to essentially cause all sorts of biological effects simply from what's in our field. Specifically with Beverly, that's the biofield. And this, another reason how this can happen, I think we have to look at Mei Wan Ho. She's my go-to, right, when it comes to liquid crystals and our liquid crystalline body. She was the first person who I read who described the body as this liquid crystalline continuum or this li liquid crystal sensitive, light sensitive matrix, right? And so what her work did show 
was that the the fascial network itself, this liquid crystalline fascia, can literally change and move. And as it changes and it moves, it alters light signaling in the body. If you're ever interested, Google her book cover called The Rainbow and the Worm. And what you're actually looking at are you're looking at little larvae from a polarized light microscope. So showing how the light can change and shift its emissions based on how the worm, worm moves and, and wiggles and changes. So that's the same thing that's happening in our bodies right now. I am this body full of liquid crystalline fascia and I'm moving and I'm shifting. But what it also is full, uh, was it had considered to have liquid crystalline properties is the DNA and its structured water around it. And so she proposed that DNA's structure allows it to act as an antenna, to conduct charge, to essentially emit this information throughout this liquid crystalline continuum to conduct what she would call quantum coherence or quantum jazz in her terms. Uh, she was also a musician as well. So essentially this means that DNA is not just this passive genetic code as a building block, uh, you know, software, if you will, for the body. And instead the DNA truly is this integral part of creating this quantum coherent body that we have. Uh, the last one I want to talk about is Fritz, Fritz Albert Pop. Fritz Albert Pop, he was the one who actually discovered biophoton emissions or a light that's being produced by the body, by our cells in this ultra, ultra weak state that we can't physically see. But if we were to use uh, sensitive devices, such as a photomultiplier device, we could actually count the biophotons that are being emitted by our bodies or by our cells. And he actually found that the DNA is a primary source of biophoton emission. Uh, he found that he found he actually found that it emits photonic uh, energy or light in a coherent laser-like fashion. So what if our intention, like Glenn Ryan showed, is changing the shape of the DNA? It changes the biophoton emissions that are being produced and directs them in a laser-like fashion to communicate something into the body or to communicate something into the biofield. Um, you know, there's all sorts of angles that we could take with this that I really love. But basically what he was proposing was that cells communicate via this biophotonic signaling and that the DNA is a key component of this. Um, anytime you have a structure that can be a, a emit, or I should say absorb and then emit coherent light, it all of a sudden becomes an antenna and a communication system. And so one of the things that I want to highlight with all of this is that all of these amazing researchers, uh, Rubik, Ryan, Raiden, Ho, Pop, they're all these researchers who are thinking outside the box when it comes to things. And unfortunately, they're they, they did not receive a lot of funding for it, right? Or they were they had their funding revoked. Um, they had to, quote unquote, pub publish in, quote unquote, you know, lesser journals because they weren't being funded by, say, large institutions or pharmaceutical, the pharmaceutical industry. Um, and so their, their work is largely ignored. It's oftentimes dismissed as being woo, even, even though when we paint the picture of connecting all these dots through something like DNA as a fractal antenna uh, and looking at all of their different contributions, I, we can start to see the picture of how amazing the human body is when it comes to being able to receive all sorts of energy and information, emit all sorts of energy and information, which means also, I think, in a, a, an additional jump into this conversation, a final jump into this conversation is, what what are changes in the Schumann harmonics, the Schumann frequencies, right? We hear about that. That's that's you know the heartbeat of the earth. But what happens when that that heartbeat all of a sudden goes stronger? Is it literally affecting our DNA? Is it literally affecting our DNA's winding or unwinding, or the DNA's ability to send? Yeah, energy and in, send information based on that signal reception. So I truly believe that our DNA and the structured water around that DNA is an antenna for that exact type of information. And that can allow for all sorts of things from the, at the most basic level, from the changing in gene expression to a, a more, maybe more esoteric lens for consciousness expansion. So such a cool way to view the DNA, way better than what I was taught in undergrad. Um, and yeah, let me know, let me know your thoughts. I'd love to, love to hear them in the comments.